present this topic, Madam called me and she told me that this is a very important topic and we should be discussing this uh, in our uh, update, which is going to be done today. So the topic that has been given to me is basically the importance of protein intake and especially so in peritoneal dialysis patients. So before I start, uh, I have to also uh, congratulate my previous speaker, uh, Dr. Jitu, for having given us a total insight into chronic kidney disease progression, as well as uh, the role of low protein diet uh, in his entire talk and how it also helps in retardation of progression of chronic kidney disease. So to begin with, I have to tell you that there is a positive impact of the nutritional status on the health and treatment adequacy of peritoneal dialysis patients. And this has been well established over and over again over the past few decades. Protein intake is an important factor and it can be used to stratify patients into malnutrition, normal nutrition, and with adequate intake, it can lead to reduction in protein energy wasting during the course of therapy. There are several guidelines and there are several uh, societies which have given uh, their own recommendations on intake of protein. So here I will discuss with you the chief guidelines. I will not take you to the major studies because I have about 20 to 25 minutes to discuss this topic. So here you see very clearly here that when you're looking at the nutritional requirement in patients on dialysis, whether it's hemodialysis or the peritoneal dialysis, the guidelines on both sides of the table state that the micronutrient intake is almost the same. However, there is a definite difference in the intake of protein in the hemodialysis population as compared to the peritoneal dialysis. There is a higher requirement of protein in the peritoneal dialysis population as compared to the hemodialysis. As I take you further, I will explain to you why it is so important for us to have a higher protein intake in patients on peritoneal dialysis. So what are the nutritional parameters predictive of outcomes in peritoneal dialysis? The most important and the most cleanly studied parameter is serum albumin. A low serum albumin is highly predictive of a nutritional parameter. Also, reduce urea nitrogen appearance. Apart from that, a decrease in edema-free as well as a fat-free mass. And as the previous speaker has very clearly alluded, the presence of a low serum creatinine is also correlating with malnutrition. Apart from that, a decrease in total body nitrogen content and a poor poorer overall protein and energy nutritional status as assessed by subjective global assessment is a very strong predictive parameter for outcomes in peritoneal dialysis. As I take you through this uh, populated slide, which is basically on the global nutrition recommendations in peritoneal dialysis, we'll see over here very clearly that the quality of evidence is high for patients uh, for patients who are on dialysis when it comes to talking about calcium, phosphorus, potassium. But when, come, when it comes to calories and protein, the quality of evidence is still not very high. So why are we discussing about protein in peritoneal dialysis patients? So all dialysis patients are subjected to a concept called as protein energy wasting. And the chief reasons for that is dietary nutrient intake. So when they have a reduction in dietary nutrient intake, this causes, because, which is because of loss of kidney functions, because of uremic toxins, apart from that comorbid conditions such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, socioeconomic problems, depression. Apart from that, an important concept of dialysis associated catabolism, which is secondary to the ubiquinone pathway activation. There's also metabolic derangements in such as metabolic acidosis, hyperparathyroidism, and to add to all this, there is hyperinflammation. So all of this will lead to protein energy wasting. So what's going to happen if you have protein energy wasting? All of our patients who have protein energy wasting are going to be more predisposed to infection, which would mean more hospitalization, more morbidity, more cardiovascular disease, which means more hospitalization, more mortality, and also increase in the frailty index as well as the depression score in our patients. 
which obviously correlates and spoils all the efforts that we do in maintaining our patients. So protein energy wasting is not just about uh, the chemical part. There's several other pathological factors that will produce uh, protein energy wasting, such as presence of volume overload, free radicals, dialysis inflammation, loss of renal function, endocrinopathies such as diabetes, hyperparathyroidism, anemia, metabolic acidosis, anorexia, decrease intake, nutrient intake. Is, these are the factors that we've already discussed about. This is then complicated by the presence of uremia, causing malnutrition, also hypercatabolism, more inflammation, and all of this, as we've discussed before, will lead to increased morbidity and mortality because of increased cardiovascular disease. With this slide, I would like to take you back to the first speaker who has very clearly explained to us what are the different stages of chronic kidney disease and how the staging is done. As you move from the left to the right, you see as the stages of chronic kidney disease increase, it's not just a fall in GFR or it's not just a rise in creatinine. It's a multitude of factors which are responsible for what happens to patients because of which they're highly predisposed to increased chances of death, secondary to protein energy wasting, sarcopenia, and cachexia. When you move from the left to the right, you will see that there is a higher chance of hypercatabolism, higher chance of inflammation, higher chance of malnutrition, all of which will then be a high predictor for death in our patients. So what is the prevalence of protein energy wasting? Well, there is no clear data on what is the exact prevalence of protein energy wasting in our patients, but there seems to be an estimate of protein energy wasting in dialysis patients. It seems to average around 40%, and most of these will have mild to moderate protein energy wasting. Less than 10% are known to have severe protein energy wasting. This is the data that we've collected. However, this is all Western data. So when you're having a patient with peritoneal dialysis, the most important thing here is to look at his protein intake. There are a multitude of factors such as loss of residual renal function, which is responsible for increased inflammation, increased anorexia, cachexia, and this builds the balance towards more protein wasting because of reduced intake of uh, food, which, is, which correlates into reduced energy intake. However, in the presence of increased catabolism secondary to protein breakdown in our patients. So what is the clinical criteria for protein energy wasting in chronic kidney disease? The criteria is basically divided into four different parts. The first is based on the serum biochemistry, which is basically the serum albumin less than 3.8 gram per deciliter, or use the pre-albumin, which is more predictor, which is a better predictor of uh, malnutrition in our patients because of a shorter half-life of less than 30 milligrams per deciliter. And this is especially used in patients who are on dialysis, or the BMI of less than 23 kilogram per meter square, where there's a 5% weight loss over three months or 10% over six months but the total body fat percentage should be less than 10% in these patients. There's also muscle mass loss category, which says that 5% reduction in muscle mass over three months or 10% over six months in the presence of reduced mid-arm muscle circumference by 10% in relation to 50th percentile or lower than expected serum creatinine. There's also a criteria of deficient dietary intake, so deficient dietary intake is basically associated with intake of protein. So less than 0.8 gram per kg per day of protein for at least two months in a dialysis patients or less than 25 kilocalories per kg per day for at least two months. So this criteria has to be satisfied for a patient to be diagnosed as protein energy wasting. So how will you assess your patients for, for the nutritional status? especially the peritoneal dialysis patients. We start off with screening our patients. 
So you will screen them for the body mass index as already said before. You look at their weight, you calculate their daily protein intake and also the malnutrition inflammation score. So these patients are screened every one to three months. And when you suspect that a patient has protein energy wasting and fulfills the criteria of PEW, you assess them using the subjective global assessment. Or if you have a dialysis patient and if you have the availability of serum prealbumin, you could do that. So once the criteria, which we've already discussed before, has been satisfied, you further look into the dietary protein intake. And then for at least two months, you follow up these patients further to tell them that they are protein energy wasting. So now once the clinical criteria is fulfilled, you will identify and first treat the reversible causes. What are these causes? So these are basically metabolic acidosis, microinflammation, infection, if any, presence of diabetes, which is uncontrolled, or congestive heart failure, which is not controlled and is requiring repeated uh, hospitalizations or repeated increase in diuretics. So this has to be optimized first because all of this in turn causes more of inflammation. You have to also optimize the renal replacement treatment and continue the nutritional counseling, especially in patients who are on dialysis. So then you look into the protein intake of these patients. The protein intake, you should at least have a protein intake of 1.2 gram per kg per day. There are guidelines which take it to 1.4 gram per kg per day. And if these patients develop peritonitis, which is basically an inflammation and infection of your peritoneal membrane, then the increase in protein intake is up to 1.5 gram per kg per day. Also, there is a requirement for energy which has to be at least 30 to 35 kilocalories per kg per day, uh, including some kilocalories from the dialysate, which is approximately 100 to 500 grams of glucose uh, per day. So then after that, once you have provided all of this, it's, it's recommended to follow these patients at least on a monthly basis and look at the response to treatment. So how would you assess the response to treatment? You look at their weight gain. There should be at least a 20% weight gain over a period of two, year, two months and a serum albumin of at least 3.8 or more. And the weight gain has to be obviously the dry body weight. If you do have something like this, then you will continue therapy. In case you don't, then you intensify either the feeding or you intensify the dialysis or you can use adjunctive therapies which can improve nutrition. So coming to the di dietary protein intake. So the recommended dietary protein intake for patients on peritoneal dialysis uh, as per the k key is approximately 1.2 to 1.3 gram per kg per body weight per day. And the nitrogen balance studies have shown that this figure has been authenticated because it's associated with neutral or positive nitrogen balance. In your CAPD patients, you have an average loss of approximately 8 to 15 grams of protein per day. And this increases further during episodes of peritonitis. So obviously, the dietary protein intake will simultaneously in increase in these patients. Coming now next to the nutritional guidelines for patients on peritoneal dialysis. So as per the Polycystic Kidney Disease Foundation, there is a specific daily recommendation of up to 1.4 gram per kg per day of protein intake. However, this is uh, slightly higher than the European guideline recommendation, which is 1 to 1.2 gram per kg per day. Now, there are certain studies which have actually echoed to the fact that peritoneal dialysis patients with an intake equal or greater than 1 gram per kg per day of protein will remain in a neutral or positive nitrogen balance while those with a lower intake are at risk of being in the negative nitrogen balance. So the, the magical figure is approximately 1 to 1.4 gram per kg per day. So as for the KDGO and Canadian guidelines, they do not include any specific protein intake recommendations. But when they compare the nutritional intake between three large groups, such as the non-dialysis, CKD, hemodialysis, and peritoneal dialysis, the only nutrient level intake that differs seems to be protein. So patients who are non-dialysis CKD patients uh, 
about which we've heard about a lot in the previous talk, uh, they will require about 0.6 to 0.8 gram per kg per day. However, you can increase it to one gram per kg per day during illness, and you could go lower if you're using uh, keto analogs. While patients on hemodialysis will require more than 1.2 gram per kg per day, and peritoneal dialysis patients will require at least 1.2 gram per kg per day. Now, when we look at the uh, International Society of Renal Nutrition and Metabolism guidelines, they also recommend a protein intake of more than 1.2 gram per kg per day and to increase during peritonitis. The energy intake is 30 to 35 kilocalories per kg per day. And this increases if uh, a patient is either uh, suffering from illness and this will reduce in patients who are more than 65 years of age. So it's always good to interact with your patients and to explain to them what is the importance of taking a high protein diet or even calculating their protein and increasing their protein intake once you recognize that they're going towards protein energy wasting. So this is just a small pictorial just to tell you that this is what can be distributed to the dietitians or to the patients where they can just about calculate uh, a rough estimate of how much protein has to be taken per diet and how you can go about selecting which protein you can take. This can be simplified depending on the unit that one works in or the, the strata of uh, patients that you are dealing with. So when you're treating patients of uh, protein energy wastings, uh, for patients in whom the standard preventive measures are unable to diminish the loss of protein energy stores, nutritional supplementation should be initiated through oral, intraperitoneal, enteral, or parenteral routes. And to, to ensure that the oral nutrition is improved, you can also use appetite stimulants or anabolic agents such as magistrol. People have also used some anti-inflammatory uh, interventions and also exercise to increase the appetite of these patients. So coming to the oral nutrition supplement, they can provide an additional of about seven to 10 kilocalories per kg per day and approximately 0.3 to 0.4 gram per kg per day of protein. But this requires a minimum spontaneous dietary intake of 20 kilocalories per kg per day of energy and 0.4 to 0.8 gram per kg per day of protein to meet the recommended uh, dietary energy intake and dietary protein intake targets. And maybe that's the reason why the oral nutrition supplement is still not very popular. So when we come to intraperitoneal nutritional supplementation, this is unfortunately not available in our part of the continent, available only in the USA and in Canada, where they have a 1.1% amino acid bag, which provides approximately 17 to 18 grams of amino acids per exchange. However, there is a problem of metabolic acidosis. So we know that uh, the rationale for this is there is a loss of at least three to four grams of amino acids per day uh, per, per exchange. And that amounts to about 50, nearly 15 grams per day of protein loss per day. Uh, discussing a little about the enteral nutrition, which has not been very properly investigated in patients with uh, on peritoneal dialysis. However, uh, it should be considered uh, for its use because the, the there could be an improvement in our patients when we use uh, proper enteral uh, nutrition supplements. The feeding formulas with a higher protein but lower co carbohydrate content have to be preferred. And products which are rich in protein should be used as oral nutrition supplements. So to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd like to say that protein energy wasting is very frequent in our PD patients and is associated with significant morbidity as well as mortality. To assess and monitor the nutritional status, it is important to diagnose, prevent, and treat protein energy wasting. There should be some large-scale clinical trials and international collaborations that should refer to the effects of nutritional interventions on peritoneal, on a PEW, and these are necessary in order to advance on this subject. Individualization of different in interventions for prevention and treatment of protein energy wasting is, should be proposed uh, in the next chapter that we should be discussing and should be employed in most of our PD patients. Thank you very much for your patient listening.